Okay, uh, uh, I am Alexander Frumkin, and uh, I am a gel coach from San Francisco Bay Area, and welcome to our um, Agile Practitioner online user group. It is session number seven, and we are lucky to host Jenny Gandal today, talking about less. But before I pass the ball to Jenny, let's go around and quickly introduce ourselves. Where are we calling from and what brought you here? What would you like to see in this uh, meeting and how we could potentially make it better? So how about if I pass the ball to Emilia? Um, I am also an Agile coach. I'm Amelia Breton. I'm an Agile coach out of the San Francisco Bay Area as well. And I am really looking forward to getting a bigger picture of less. Um, and I will pass the ball to Michael. Michael Dalamatha, Agile coach, San Francisco. I'm curious about the sushi concept. Dan Greening. Uh, yeah, so I'm Dan Greening. I'm in Berkeley. Um, I'm an Agile coach too. Uh, I've done a bunch of stuff which some people know about and I'm researching the general fundamental patterns of all Agile practices, including and Lean Startup and Lean Manufacturing and even Pomodoro. Uh, Dan, would you like to pass the ball to somebody else? I do, I do. Uh, Evas? <laughs> Hi, my name is Elena Vassiliva. I'm Agile coach and currently I'm based in Santa Monica. And I'm very interested in Lean, how we can use it to align uh, not the software part of the organization and the organizational agility level. And I'm passing to Jay Shri. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Jay Shri. I'm from Toronto and I'm a newly found scrum master. You could say that I was thrown in in the last three years. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm quite interested in today's last talk is because I dealt with two offices, multiple layers of management and roles, and I'm quite interested to see what the conversation comes up in um, this workshop. And I guess. And who would you like to pass the ball? I'll pass the ball to Dale. Don't hear you, you're on mute. I'm on mute? No, Dale, Dale is on oh, mute. Dale. No, I'm on mute. <clears throat> yep, there we go. Okay. Uh, my name is Dale Ellis. I'm an Agile coach in the San Francisco Bay Area also. Uh, and I'm currently working in a safe environment. And I'm looking to get more, uh, I've seen a couple of short presentations at conferences on less, and I'd like to get a better understanding of it to uh, see how I might be able to employ that uh, in some of the environments that I'm in. And the ball goes to? Oh, uh, let's see. <laughs> how many more people do we have? Uh, Lisa, we should already go. Uh, yep. No, no, no. Uh, I am Lisa Engelbert. I am somebody that's just transitioning in full time to being an Agile coach. And I am based in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, and I'm really interested in uh, today's discussion topic because um, I've heard some presentation and done some reading, um, but I would like to learn more because I have an opportunity for it. And I will pass the ball over to Kesh. Thank you, Lisa. My name is... My name is Keshav. I work here as an agile coach uh, here in Bangalore. So I'm joining this discussion to learn more about 
less and to learn from all of you. So I'll pass the uh, ball to Michael Del Della. Yes. Michael. Yes. Uh, so I've already gone. I think the only person who didn't have a chance uh, to, to talk is, oh, we have one more person. Uh, how about Bill? Uh, could you uh, introduce yourself? Yes, hi. Um, and I don't have video on this PC I'm using, so I'll, you'll just have to trust that I'm a really good looking guy. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a Scrum Master, uh, certified Scrum Master uh, from Houston. And I, in between jobs, I used to work in the United IT department, um, but they're downsizing here. So uh, I'm currently also getting, working on my, getting my certification for agile product owner right now. And so just, I saw this um, uh, listed and it looked like a good way to uh, hear what other people are concerned with right now and, and some of the challenges they have. So I wanted to listen in. Okay, welcome. And uh, would you like to pass the ball to, to somebody else? Uh, well, I got in just a couple of minutes ago, so I'm not sure who's spoken and who hasn't. Okay, uh, so maybe Dale, uh, you would introduce yourself. Uh. I already went if you're speaking to me. Dale? Sasha, you're on mute. I think we all went. Yes, yeah, so we all went. Welcome. Nice to see you guys. There are some new faces. Glad to see that. And with that, I think I will pass uh, the ball uh, permanently to Jeannie. I will make you co-host. And uh, you have the flight controls. And please do tell me, um, uh, Sasha, uh, what do I click? I'm not that familiar with Zoom. What do I click to start sharing my screen? Uh, pause recording. I, do I do anything? Do, do, you, do you guys see my screen or do you not? I don't see anything shared yet. Okay, so well, as soon as I figure out how to share, um, and that's all I'm recording, my... my I my think if you wiggle the mouse, out. you'll see at the bottom of your screen. At the bottom of the screen, you have a toolbar. And you see invite, manage participants, and share your screen. The green. Oh, okay. It's right in my face. I apologize. <laughs> I'll do more about it. Okay, I got it. So now you're going to see my screen, and that's going to be the sl slide number one. I should say ag or Agile Organization Trading Orgs as a sushi roll. You see that? We see it. Okay, let's, let's kick off then. I'll be toggling in between two decks, I think. Um, but you know, as long as this is the right monitor. <laughs> okay, thank you for, for the time taking. For, thank you for the offer, the invitation, Sasha. Uh, uh, in a very quick, humble way, uh, just two words about me. I'm out of New York City. Uh, Gene Gandal, I've been um, coaching, training, consulting uh, for some time now. Um, organizational design consultant is probably the best way to describe what I do. Uh, comes in various forms, uh, coaching and training, of course, but also doing a lot of uh, system dynamics analysis and system modeling. Now, today's topic, um, you know, I, I, from what I heard, um, from what I heard from others, it sounds like uh, many folks mentioned they're here to hear more about less. Great. So, I, on the fly, as I was preparing for this, I thought, okay, well, I have our, and to prove that I'm actually telling you. Uh, nothing but truth. I'm going to toggle. I'm going to toggle between the, these two decks. So this one says large-scale Scrum review, which is budgeted for one hour. But quite frankly, guys, this is a pretty dry deck, and I have. I'm going to reserve it for uh, another occasion, and I've used it a plenty for very specific needs. Um, I will probably refer to it today, maybe you know sporadically here and there, uh, for some nice um, native, authentic graphics of less, but. I really want to concentrate on this one that's specifically put together to drive across a more fundamental principle that drives less itself. Organizational design, organizational descaling, system modeling. And of course, um, you know, here and there and elsewhere, I will be 
referencing to less um, uh, principles and um, less guides, okay? So that's really going to be a more interesting conversation in my view, okay? So with that said, let me kick off and um, share my screen. I'm sorry, uh, go to the slide, uh, slide view mode your current slide. What, what do you see now? Uh, I want to make sure I want to make sure you see in the animated so side of the, uh, um, the Okay, can you see it now? Or should I change the um, Okay, I want you to see this. Now you are seeing a, a, a big view, correct? The whole the whole the whole screen is taken up by the slide. Okay, that's what I want. Cool. So let me kick off. Um, as an opening statement, and this is, I'm actually, I'm really stealing this from some, someone by the name Janet Bumpus, who spoke at uh, Poland Krakow um, Agile event in 2017. If you really want to get um, good people and start and kick off an innovation project, you got to go to HR and find the thickest file. Okay. So those people that will make things happen and drive you uh, forward, most likely already have a track record somewhere. And HR is probably one of the places where it happens. Okay, not implying myself, but there are some great, great people that um, are known for being very vocal, and those are the people that make the difference. Uh, next one, the the term of agile has has been very uh, challenging for many and very confusing for many. And I want to really get the 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 the, the nomenclature, the terminology straight, and uh, not. Uh, everyone out there understands that agile is not a noun. It's actually an adjective. Just by going by, if we go by Wikipedia, uh, it gives you a bunch of synonymous words, limbo, leth, supple, limber. And if you go back to 2001, uh, you know, some of you may or may not know, in Snowboard, Utah, when the 17 guys got together to write Agile Manifesto, Agile wasn't the really, uh, the, the, wasn't the, the main word, the, the, the primary um, um, candidate to be elected. Uh, the original word was adaptive by Jim Highsmith. And then everyone else turned and said, Jim, you're going to get all the business because you have the word adaptive in your book, adaptive software engineering, I think, and also in your company's name. So we need to look for another word. And Mike Beetle, I believe, who isn't even a, you know, he's half Polish, half uh, Spanish, if I'm not mistaken. English is his second language. He came up with this not so popular word at that time, agile, because not too many people actually know what it is. And so it was. So Agile was the word. And uh, whenever you see this, um, you know, all these uh, high, you know, high profile, fancy corporate terms, implement Agile, adopting, introducing, accepting, you know, right off the bat that people don't understand what they're talking about. This, this, is, an this is not an adjective. I'm sorry. This is, this, this, is, this, is not an, this is not a noun. This is an adjective. Okay. So all these, uh, all these, uh, combinations is a good indication that people are just trying to in, unwrap and install. Okay. Uh, next on, next one off, and why this is really happening. Oftentimes you um, uh, don't understand why there's so much fat out there. Then you look at what companies often do, uh, especially you look at how they, you know, how they treat um, coaches and, and uh, organizational design agents, and you see this positive, vicious feedback loop uh, where they rely on bad candidates, rely on bad um, uh, coaches, and those coaches drive the system down further. And based on those lowered standards, companies go out and hire more coaches that have low standards and just a vicious cycle. And many of you are in business, and all of you are in business, and you probably have felt it in your own skin, as I have. It sometimes is just way, 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 way too difficult to explain why companies have such a low bar for agile coaching profession. And it's 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 been it has become a fad, uh, fad out there, which is very hard to fight. Um, and you know, but I, I, I guess my, my point is all has always been if you start in, in the right place in the agile transformation, uh, you're going to have a much higher chance of succeeding. So if you start with values, I'm sorry, if you start with principles, as many companies go just for best, I'm sorry, for, with practices, with practices, they look for best practices. Uh, tool installation, uh, best techniques, uh, events, ceremonies, uh, you're just going to get that far. Uh, a much better place would be to start with principles and um, even better off you would be if you start with values. So there's some core values and some uh, core agile 
uh, values. I, I think we now have four of them and they are supported by 12 principles. And if you start in that direction from bottom up, there is a much higher chance to come up with your own best practices. And in, in personally, I'm not a big fan of the word best. There are so many um, practices out there, thousands of them. I wouldn't call them any of them best. People that are looking for best practices are usually look, look for shortcuts, okay? So my next word of introduction, of course, of course, if you see companies concentrate only on tooling, it's a good indication that they, they, missed, they missed the plot. This is not where agility begins, and this is certainly not where it ends. Um, some of the slides, I was just pass through slides, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna take you right through them. Uh, we actually say this in the last quite a bit. It's, a, it's a, one of the a profound messages that large-scale Scrum uh, delivers. Uh, you want to own your own decisions as opposed to renting others. It's like an IKEA effect, right? If you're familiar with the IKEA effect, when you build something on your own, when you put something together, you start cherishing this and put much more value in your uh, merchant, in, in your purchase. Same thing with, uh, with owning your own decisions. When you rent someone else's, when you uh, unwrap and install someone else's, someone else's uh, solution, chances are you're going to give it up if it doesn't work. You're not going to fight for it. You're not going to cherish it. So we want to own our own decisions, especially in large-scale Scrum. Adoptions take months, sometimes years, and you really want to own those decisions. Um, I'm going to rely on the ch old Chinese proverb. Um, you give a man a fish, you're going to you know, feed him for a day. You teach him how to fish, he's going to be fat forever. That's the... That's the uh, uh, one of the key principles um, of less adoption. We want people to own their own decisions. And there was a lot of pressure out there, peer pressure. And that's why we have so much renting. People, you know, teams look at other teams and they just copy paste solutions of others. And that's why we have so much copy paste scrum out there. There's a guy by the name Cesario Ramos. You may want to jot down his name. I'll send you a link later. He has a great article out there about copy paste scrum. There's a fundamental difference between copy paste scrum where you're just copying and pasting Scrum team sporadically and multiplying product owners and multiplying Scrum masters uh, in a linear fashion as, and as opposed to proper scaling by exp expanding your products wider, by um, defining your products better and, and, and creating your backlogs that, are, that, that support, entire back, uh, su support entire products. So um, renting really is, uh, is a good way to end up with a copy-paste Scrum and many organizations have it and they call it um, scaling but it's really not it's just a huge portfolio of junk and and gobbly gook um beware of this it's called agile uh, i stole I, i'm actually plagiarizing by someone by name by name yuval forget his last name he's actually a safe practitioner but um i was at one of his uh, uh speeches a few years back and i stole this term from him now i'm borrowing i'm sure others do too scripted play of at agile theater, right? So think about it this way. You have 17 pages, I think, in a, in a scrum guide. There's gotta be a reason why someone came up with 342 pages that describes best practices of scrum. I mean, what ha happened to be, what, what, what's meant to be an empirical process ends up to be a prescriptive manual that you also almost need to parse line by line to execute. And then it's just, that's, that's a good indication. That's a theater, right? It's a fad. People are pretending. Okay. So you just be watch out. You have to watch out for that. Uh, so uh, in large scale adoptions, where, where do you really start? Um, and uh, one of the major takeaways, uh, if, if nothing else, and hope something more than this uh, or phrase only, but uh, a, a, a one big message that Les uh, sends across is, Organizational descaling is, is, is mandatory for Scrum to scale effectively. Think about this phrase. In order to scale your Scrum, you need to descale your organization. So if you have an APIC structure, top-down totalitarian control, you know, uh, almost like a you know, very sharp pyramid, that's really not a good organizational design to, to adopt less because in large-scale Scrum adoptions, you remove a lot of MUDA. You, you, you remove a lot of... Um, interim organizational tiers that uh, create uh, translation and, um, and what's called contractual relationships between one department and another department, one silo and another silo. And in order for this to happen, you need to descale your organization. You have to flatten it. And when you start your adoption, you have to start equally um, effectively from the top and from the bottom. 
uh, would have, without having senior leadership support, um, and scaled adoption will almost inevitably fail. And when we say in, in less, uh, there's, there must be um, an informed consent, uh, literally, almost like a legal document signed. Well, it's, it's you know, figuratively speaking, but senior leadership has to be in, very well informed and has to, must give its consent that it understands what large scale Scrum adoption really means. It really means that you start, you're gonna start using Scrum as a building block, as a fa foundational block to build the organization, at least within IT um, structure. And of course, you need a lot of support and a lot of momentum at team level because uh, training and teaching and, 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 and coaching will, hap will happen there as well. So it's really top down and bottom up approach. So um, again, on point, organizational structure is the first order factor that defines ecosystem dynamics. And that's uh, a very uh, critical, very foundational principle of LESS. And Craig Larman and Basavori, who are the, the co-founders of LESS, uh, are very, very explicit about this. And I've heard and I've seen Craig teach and speak a lot. And he always refers to the to this, uh, you know, to this uh, very key concept. Organizational design by far supersedes everything else. And if you have seen uh, five laws of uh, Larman's laws of organizational behavior, uh, it speaks explicitly about organizational design. Organizational structure sets the tone to organizational culture in large organizations. Okay. So, and speaking of which, uh, and why do I personally like referring to a large scale, a large scale scrum adoption as a sushi roll is because of that. This actually an extract from, from less.works website. Um, and this is a code. Um, this is actually the quote from scrum Alliance website, um, referring to less.works site and, uh, by Craig Larman himself, uh, alluding to what it requires for organizational transformation to become success. It is not just IT um, silo. It requires um, research and development department. It requires uh, product management, legal practice, HR policies, site strategies. All of that must be uh, engulfed, must be included in, in organizational, um, organizational transformation. We say in, law, in less, we don't want transformations to be broad and shallow like one big bang across the entire, the entire enterprise, 3,000 people at once, just turn the switch overnight, binary switch from Friday to Monday, now we, no, it ain't gonna work. We want transformations to be deep and narrow. And therefore, surprisingly, or, or probably not surprisingly, uh, large scale scrum adoptions, um, uh, simple less adoption requires, um, expects no more than 50, I would say 55 going 60, or that would be a stretch people. And that really, uh, this is really between two to eight scrum teams. And actually, in, in less we simplify terminology, we don't refer to, to teams as scrum teams. We just call them teams because it is scrum. And as a matter of fact, another big on point is this. Large-scale scrum is scrum. It is not um, some foundational layer of scrum on, upon which you have other organizational layers and, and complexity built. And I'm not going to allude to any other frameworks or approaches that do that. Large scale Scrum is Scrum foundationally and it uses Scrum as a building block. Okay. And it, and it values the, the, everything that Scrum gives. It just requires multiple teams scrumming together on the same cadence, uh, concurrently working for the same customer, AK product owner on the same widely defined product. So there's, that's another takeaway. So, and why do we, why do I think of it as a sushi roll? Because, it isn't just technology of 50 folks and a product owner that are involved. You really have to think about holistically, organizationally, what else is required for this sushi roll to not to go rotten? What does it, uh, what is it, what, what is expected from the organizational uh, restructure in order for less to succeed? Well, you obviously need to think of uh, side strategies, right? Because um, you want to have a collocated teams and if you do end up with multi-side development, when you have multiple teams um, participating in the same less, you still want to have whole teams collocated together. So side strategies are critical. Um, HR policies, I can't stress it more than enough. It's it just can't stress it enough how important it is to um, 
amend HR policies to support agility. Uh, I'm not going to go and try to cover everything that comes out of HR, but things like uh, motivation uh, in the form of monetary incentives, perks, and bonuses uh, is a huge has a huge impact on organizational agility. Has huge impact on how individuals interact, um, even in basic Scrum. Now, if you think of any dysfunction that uh, perks and bonuses could cause for individual Scrum teams, imagine what it's going to cause when you're trying to scale this. So if you have this function on basic scrum level, you're going to immediately scale it. So it's not actually, it's not going to be a linear. It's going to be um, a super linear relationship. So those things do matter. So think of a sushi roll. Each layer of, of the roll represents another organizational silo, another organizational um, layer that is res responsible for making your, um, making your less adoption successful. Okay. So enough on this slide. Let me move on to um, this one. So this is just a pass through, um, just to uh, stress the fact that um, all these things are uh, important. Uh, when you look at organization as a sushi roll, technology departments, IT, product management, your product owners, budget and finance, critical. Can't stress enough, especially when it comes to budget and finance. Yeah, I'm sure I don't have to explain to anyone here on the call I have fixed budgets along with fixed scope and uh, fixed timeline impact uh, iterative development of basic scrum. Now, every, th every time you think of any potential dysfunction, organizational dysfunction that you see uh, on, at basic scrum level, just multiply it by a factor. Because when you're scaling, when, you, when you're not just copy and paste in different scrum teams, when you're actually scaling multiple teams uh, that work on the same product for the same customer, you actually um, exponentially grow your uh, effectiveness or dysfunction. So if you think HR practices and budgeting and finance, as you know them today, are problematic for basic Scrum, um, you can almost be guaranteed that in, in, in scale environments, it would be, um, it would be exponential. So what do you draw boundaries when you are trying to do agile adoption, when you're trying to uh, take uh, your company or your organization through agile transformation? You can obviously, um, you know, imagine that you have these, these two options. You can either, these are, consider these as outermost boundaries of your organization. You can start in, uh, across the entire stack, front to back, no matter how big it is, or you can look for a proper location within your organizational structure will find a happy, I call it happy niche or habitat that is good for agility and you, you do it right there. Uh, if you, start, you go with the first approach, most likely you're going to uh, bite too much to swallow. You're going to choke on it. That's why so many organizations that are trying to become, to do agile for the sake of uh, being in a, tr you know, being trendy or being, being fashionable uh, revert back in a couple of years just because it doesn't stick. They will. They fail for a very, very obvious reason. It's almost impossible to sustain this huge organizational monolithic effort, um, and especially if they don't have enough um, professional trainers and coaches that support the effort. If they're trying to do it all themselves, you know, kind of cook, cook it themselves, uh, cook, the, cook, cook the meal themselves, most likely they'll, they'll not, they will end up in a situation where it's going to be difficult for them to swallow their own effort. So you look for that little niche and this little niche, uh, let's again, refer to it as a sushi roll, uh, is a happy place where you can have um, a proper less adoption. So if you can find, you don't have to be big with less adoptions. As I mentioned, we want to be deep and narrow. So you look for, for, for part of organizational structure. Um, let's say take um, IT department. Take, you know, 40, 50, 30, 40, 50 people that you can pull together that have cross-functional skills uh, that are complementary to one another that work on the same widely defined product and see if you can circumvent them and build appropriate um, defense line around them and give them what state, what's required. Specifically, um, autonomy, sovereignty, purpose. Now I'm plagiarizing Dan Pink. Also, enough incentives and motivation to do work uh, in, a, in, in, in agile fashion, uh, specifically in Scrum. Uh, be uh, willing to share with others, be willing to learn from others. 
not to do this, and I'm really trying to uh, imitate as I'm covering my own code or my own deliverables. Uh, be share, be be sharing, be supportive of each other. Uh, this requires a lot of uh, managerial and HR support. And again, if you are thinking of t in terms of a large organization, uh, making those challenge, ma making those changes could be pro rather challenging, because changing you know HR policies for the for the, for for a large company could be pretty um, unreasonable in in one shot. Uh, but if you look for a small habitat when you can do it. Um, in a very concise and very controlled way, um, immediate management, senior enough, but still not, still local enough, they can protect their own troops, they can protect their own people and allow them to work in, in a desirable way. And I've seen this actually happening. Uh, so consider this as an ocean of, of unhappiness and, and disruption. And in the middle of that ocean, there's like an oasis, there is a small island of happiness. There's a beautiful island where people can actually work uh, to their liking, to their happiness, and obviously make their customers happy, okay? Uh, I'm gonna fast forward this one. So agility and technology is, is, is critical. Uh, all these great, uh, these great practices, TDD, C, uh, continuous integration and development, and continuous deployment, unit testing, automation, spec by example, this is all great. But as much as it's super important, uh, um, people always look, always comfortably out in the open because it's rather simple. It's very local to IT and it, it's almost historical. Anything that's local to IT, organizational, it's easier to discuss. Uh, what is not so comfortable to discuss are things that are slightly outside of IT scope. For instance, in product management. In product management, it's not always easy to discuss things that are, um, I would say, you know, for the lack of a better term, not business centric, not technology centric. For instance, uh, who is this person really? This is a product owner, same person who this, this decides what a product is. This is the same exact person who says, what is a potential shippable product increment, right? So, and, and if so, uh, he will have a say and, uh, and how and why you are sprinting, right? So you can, for instance, uh, spring along features. And if you spring along features, you're gonna be getting um, uh, the entire stack of your functionality cross-cutting from, from, from your UI all the way to the database. And this will be able, uh, this will be able, uh, and then your product owner will be able to take this as a tangible deliverable and monetize it. It has business value to it. That's great, that's great. Now, um, what does it really give? What, what are the benefits of this approach? And we stress, um, and I'm gonna use some other slides to, to show you how deeply we look at this in less. Uh, it's called feature-centric development, right? Uh, what, it is, what does it really give you? It gives you transparency, predictability, effective workflow management, shared ownership, because if this one team works on, 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 a, on a cross-cutting feature, they need to share expertise of multiple components and obviously healthy dynamics. And in the end, you're delivering business value as a secondary to all of this. Now, um, there are three types of uh, product development, which I will not dive into because we may not have enough time. But uh, here is another alternative, which is undesirable alter alternative. And we speak about this very explicitly when we talk about less. When you see teams sprinting along components, and oftentimes they do call it Scrum, you actually can. Uh, sprint and you can develop iteratively along components. But what is going to happen at the tail end, you will end up having IOUs because none of those things are um, uh, single, uh, you know, single standalone and deployable items. They, you have to do a lot of integration at the end. So when we talk about less, we speak at large uh, uh, about what's called a local optimization. Local optimization versus global optimization. Local optimization implies Everyone is very well optimized to work local on their own thing. So when you have component developers, let's say everyone is, a, you know, four database administrators, four UI designers, each one working on their own thing, you better believe it. They will be very, very, very busy and their output would be great. They will be putting out a lot of uh, component items, component chunks. None of them will be sellable. None of them will be deployable because they will require a lot of integration. 
So instead of at the end, instead of business value and, and monetary, something that can be monetized, you're going to be getting IOUs. Okay. And I'm going to use a couple of slides from uh, another deck just to illustrate how, how stronger we stress it and less. Um, another way to um, uh, visualize this, right? Um, sprinting along components is really not going to give you much other than just IOUs. And your product owner will not be happy with this. Your product owner does not buy IOUs. Uh, your product owner wants to see some monetary uh, output, some monetary outcome of, 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 of your deliverables. And this is where uh, your feature-centric development comes into play. <laughs> um, speaking of components, or oftentimes we see applications uh, as a, as a way to sprint, as a way to develop. Let me use this uh, diagram to illustrate how uh, a good uh, product development is aligned. So think of any one of these uh, snakes as potential uh, as potential products. So they cut across multiple components and and, and across multiple applications. And in in unless we stress this uh, very strongly. If, if you have a bunch of teams, even if you have eight, up to eight teams th that are not sprinting alongside features, if they're not sprinting across multiple components, they will not be delivering um, anything that's, that's shippable. And if they're not delivering anything that's shippable, they'll be just violating basic principles of Scrum. And imagine if you are not able to deliver any, anything shippable by one simple uh, Scrum team, one base, you know, called basic Scrum team. Uh, that's, that's really a bugger your product owner will not be happy. Now imagine you have eight teams sprinting the same, sprinting in the same, the same, sprinting in the same exact fashion and not being able to deliver anything tangible at the end of the sprint. So that's eight team operation, 50 man operation. That is why, this is why it's so critical when, when we build that uh, teams in less, we're very methodical. We take our time to design teams properly and make sure that each team alone can deliver a cross cutting feature. Uh, let alone um, more than two teams. So if we have multiple teams, it's even more important to have them deliver uh, something tangible at the end. Okay, uh, moving on. Let's see uh, how much time we have left. Somebody, uh, Sasha, perhaps you can give me like uh, when I'm halfway through of my time, just give me a heads up. If I'm like three quarters through, give me a heads up. How about if we ask people, do you really want to have a hard stop at seven, or if you go a little bit beyond seven, is it okay with you guys? Let's sum up, sum down. Seven meaning 10 my time. Okay, okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, I see, uh, don't see all the... Yeah, look Sorry, could you, you rephrase the could you rephrase the question please Sasha? <laughs> uh, it, just, just to, since I'm the one who's maybe Sasha's on mute, I think Sasha gave, uh, gave an option if you guys want to go until the end of the hour and have a hard stop there, which I think we can. I'll, I'll budget myself now, or um, maybe perhaps if we go a little bit beyond, uh, if it's okay too. I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, so what does thumbs up mean? Thumb up means we unleash uh, Gene and uh, let him go until he falls dead. <laughs> and uh, thumb down means uh, we have a hard stop. Give me that far because I'm already at 10 o'clock. <laughs> 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 That's why I say until you fall, fall dead. Yeah. Oh, people want me dead. Fine. My, Matt wants me dead. So, <laughs> yeah. Only if it's a dramatic death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not. Yeah. So let, let's just keep going. Keep rolling. I think I'll be. I'll be able to budget it in because I'll be skipping over some slides, folks. Just because. Um, just because. Because you know, I think you know. I mean, I'm trying to give you uh, a few a few additional flavors, and so that's fine. Okay. I think we. I'll be able to cover what I would like to cover. Um, so for instance, this slide, budget and finance, I'm, it's going to be a pass through, right? So I'm going to say this, uh, we don't have to spend too much time in this because we already mentioned this and you all are experts at this, right? Fixing scope, budget and, uh, and time, uh, will really impede your quality 
uh, quality of code, quality of product, quality, quality of your lives, uh, even with basic Scrum. Now imagine the same, uh, the same exact problem is applied to uh, many teams working together. You just multiply the problem, by, you know, it will be a factor of that. Okay, uh, what else is important here? And we speak, uh, we don't speak explicitly about budgeting in less. This is something that I'm just throwing in uh, at, my own, at my own discretion. And it, it explicitly, we don't speak, but implicitly, we do mention it. Fixed budgets kill. I mean, fixed budgets really, really hurt Scrum development. And uh, don't take it from me, take it from Jarty Boxness, who, is, uh, uh, who has done a lot of research and he runs the, uh, what's called BBRT, uh, Beyond Budgeting Roundtable out of Switzerland, I believe, in, in Scandinavia. Um, Jardy is the international person with an international name as well. He wrote a, this great book. And I can tell you, in his research, and I've seen, uh, these are my observations as well, all of the um, here listed um, uh, items are very problematic with fixed budgets. And when it comes to uh, large-scale Scrum adoptions, adoptions like uh, nowhere, nowhere else, we want flexible budgets. Uh, perhaps uh, separately from this conversation, I'll share, I have my own uh, small publication about uh, dynamic forecasting, dynamic scorecards being used instead of budgeting, a uh, fixed budgeting and how it really pays off in less, in large scale scrum, because you do have the beauty, you, you do have uh, uh, advantage when you have multiple teams scrumming together and uh, working out of the same backlog for the same product owner. They have much more stuff much more normalized than you would have uh, when you have a bunch of copy paste scrum teams that just uh, use terminology. Uh, multiple teams working together has, have, a, have a privilege, have a beauty of, have advantage of being able to plan together and forecast together and estimate together. So that goes a long way. Uh, this is a pass through slide and um, this is the interesting one because I'm going to say this. Uh, with fixed budgets, your your and this is something you can use when you talk to your customers too. We can tell them we know that when you when when you say you have uh, reached your budget limit, you also have you look at you look at it from a different perspective. Your ceiling is also your floor. You cannot spend less than X Y Z because you're not going to get it next year. So this is where you see churning and burning of money, churning and burning of capital. Yeah, oftentimes you see it at the end of the year because if you don't if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Not necessarily a less concept, but is really an uh, important one. And uh, when it comes to uh, uh, unfixing budgets and uh, actually get rid of, getting rid of budgets altogether, uh, this isn't just a euphoric state. This is not a, uh, some sort of nirvana state or, or pu pu puristic statement on my part. Scandinavian companies, European companies uh, have done this. For instance, Handel's Banking is the well-known uh, Scandinavian bank that has um, gone uh, away with Fixed budgets, Miles is a good company to know. Uh, speaking of HR, we mentioned this. I'm going to fast forward here. And I will probably, uh, let me just uh, quickly click through these um, slides and see what else stands out before I flip over to another slide and talk about less in some more depth, okay? Um, so this is going to be past. I'm going to share these with you. Some of them are less dense, some of them are more dense, and um, many underlining concepts uh, you may probably find useful. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this one because it's important, not, not just in less, but in agile organizations in general. You might, you, um, you could be familiar with what's called tribal leadership stages by David Logan. And it's a great book that I re recommend reading as well. According to, to him, there are five stages in, in tribal development, tribe one, is um, deciphered as life sucks and it's predominant in, in uh, companies or in places like uh, um, uh, uh, institutions where there's a lot of violence and hostility. Uh, stage two, which says my life sucks, that's actually 25% of workforce. You know there's great inside there, but you, but you don't like your own life. 49% says um, I'm great and you're not. And that's stage three. And this is where you see a lot of individual superstars and heroes and internal competitors. So in large scale Scrum, uh, we expect organizational redesign that takes care of this. So if you still have individual performers and superstars and heroes and, and, and people that are trying to 
um, uh, gain glory at, at expense of others, uh, then your ability to scale will be severely, um, uh, severely lowered, will be severely damaged. We want what's called stage four, when we have people saying we're great and they're not, um, as opposed to I'm great and we're not, uh, and they're not. Instead of saying I'm great and you're not, we're saying we're great and they're not. So you now you really act as a team, you really act as individuals that are work together to have something shared, something in common. And obviously stage five is a euphoric state where only 2% are workforce. I bring this up um, again and again, especially in large scale scrum adoptions, because every time we see uh, dysfunctions at team level, when people are comp competing with one another, when people are trying to gain more um, spotlight and glory in, in, in front of uh, first line management, because their first uh, mid-year appraisals and end-year reviews are dependent on it, uh, you see a lot of dysfunction. And in large-scale Scrum, when you have up to eight teams working for the same customer, this could be a, a pretty devastating, okay? Uh, moving on to um, some other slides, let's see what this I'm gonna pass through. Um, that actually tells you what happens, what you see in travel stage uh, number three internal contracts, finger pointing, system gaming. Um, and this all leads to, you know, some real, you know, cause a lot of pains to companies. Uh, we speak at large, we speak uh, a lot about management in large scale scrum. And there, are, there, there's a notion, there's a, uh, there's a misbelief, misunderstanding that uh, large scale scrum, just like basic scrum uh, puts a halt to management, to, ma to management, to managerial discipline. This is not true at all. For instance, just like in less, uh, just like in Scrum, where managers are not required, in less managers are not required unless they are required. It is not a mandate to have a manager that manages a Scrum team. And by the same token, it's not a mandate to have a manager that manages less formation, up to eight teams. And if we do have managers, they have to be focused on something different. They have to be focused on enabling teams and removing impediments. They're not forced, um, they're not expected to collect status reports. They're not expected to assign work. They're not expected to uh, manage day-to-day -day operational um, operation and routine. This is all done by self-managed teams, okay? So if uh, we have managers that are servant leaders, great. And if we don't, if we have command and controllers, they either have to become servant leaders or they have to be removed from teams. And that's, that's the fact that that's the message we deliver in Scrum. Um, I do suggest you playing this when you get a chance. Grassroots of modern control. Um, uh, I have this summarized elsewhere. You can certainly uh, read on your own um, and understand, at least in my view, some of the grassroots of modern command and control behavior. And uh, if you have a chance, also play what you, you can take the name down, John Carter, Resistance to Change. Uh, he also has a great book out there. He is the um, HBR um, uh, uh, professor from Howard University. Um, he explains why so many so many managers they have um, are resistant to changes. Uh, the takeaway um, in less is this: uh, another, uh, you got to pay people enough so you remove money off the table. It probably it is probably true in basic Scrum, but it becomes even more important in large scale Scrum adoptions. If you, have, if you have individuals that are worried about being paid, uh, and these are uh, really, you know, instead of thinking about improving products and improving uh, software engineering techniques, they're thinking about how they can trick the system and get a better, bon a bigger bonus, um, that's a major sign of, this, a sign of dysfunction. For intellectual work, money has to be removed from the table. Uh, let's see, uh, this is a pass through slide. So these are great slides for you to refer to, to support the idea of uh, improving organizational norms and values, okay? Some of these uh, publications I, I strongly recommend, I mean, all of these, and I usually don't recommend a book unless I've read it. So all of this is just a great summary of what performance appraisals and monetary incentives uh, create for people at companies. I bet some of you have read at least some of these books. Um, some 
quotes that you may probably leverage in your daily routine as well. Um, some publications and uh, let me uh, take a sharp turn and actually bring it a little closer to, I don't want to call it boring stuff because this is, it's not boring. It's, it's rather, it's cut and dry, straightforward, and it's easy to read on less.work site uh, or uh, perhaps uh, just by looking at less graphics. But I think uh, a couple of these statements I would like to make now, they're pretty, they're pretty important. I'll use the, the very well-known role of a Scrum Master, right? And it's just a very basic role, uh, one of the three basic roles, one of the three and only roles, I'm sorry. It's a little too late in the day. One, one of the three key and only roles in basic Scrum as defined by Ken Schwaber and Jeff, Jeff Sutherland. Now, this role is very uh, misunderstood in my experience by companies. Even at basic Scrum level, we see a lot of uh, what I refer to as terminology hijacking and uh, old names and old terminology repurposing and, and mapping it to new names and new terminology. Now, just taking someone on Friday who was a BA or project manager and just relabeling that person, and on Monday morning, he or she is called a Scrum Master, it's not a good way to go. Okay, and as some of you, I see, I see not in your, your, your heads, you probably have seen this a lot. Uh, if your company takes um, agility seriously, and not your company per se, but maybe your clients' companies, they, they have to look at agile roles, scrum roles, very seriously, very importantly. Uh, look at HR uh, directory, look at HR database. If, they see a, if you see a mapping table that maps all the roles to new roles, through some unique identifier, that's a good indicator that they're playing the game, right? See, if you see a, 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 the, the role of a project manager or the role of a business analyst, and it's mapped to the former is mapped to a scrum master, the latter is mapped to uh, a product owner, it's a good sign of a dysfunction. The companies are just very feared to let go, right? So taking someone who's a BA and just repurposing them and making them product owner overnight, this person is not empowered, they don't stand strategy, they don't have exposure to customers, nothing, nothing, nothing. Then making them in a product owner, just relabeling. It's terminology hijacking, right? Same thing goes with, it. and of course it goes for a Scrum Master. It's a critical role. So first of all, it's not a hobby. It's not a pass through role. Um, today I'm doing it, tomorrow I'm not. It's a full-time gig. So uh, some of you, at least, I think at least uh, Michael and Michael but wholeheartedly understand what I'm saying now. And I think uh, Dan Greening will know too. Uh, it, it, we, we also know the, we use the, uh, uh, you know, we, we have accreditations called Certified Team uh, Coach. So that, that's a Scrum Alliance uh, accreditation. And I think it's very, very powerful and very, um, very senior accreditation to give to someone. Now, um, if I were to ever make a mapping a table, right, and, made, and created, you know, my own genes dictionary, I would think that someone who um, is a full-time Scrum Master in large-scale Scrum is a very good candidate for, to become a certified team coach. And this is not the discussion about certifications at all. It's just to give you an idea that someone who uh, claims to be a Scrum Master for less uh, is a very seasoned individual. And it's not a uh, pass-through role just for, for a couple of months or a couple of weeks. Um, over time, uh, his or her focus will change. Uh, focus on product ownership and team dynamics will probably drop just because of a certain degree of maturity. Whereas um, focus on development practices and organizational design, special organizational design, will, st will, will start growing. It always starts with it too. But then it drops because once you form your your, your last teams, uh, then uh, you kind of you start operating in a certain fashion. But then you realize there are, there are a lot of organizational impediments that might be uh, hitting on your less uh, formation, and this is where less uh, scrum masters come in. So this is not a pass through role. Uh, that's it uh, on the scrum master for now. Um, I'm going to skip ar uh, around the. Um, well, maybe I'll play through because it's actually, it's going to go very, very easy. So I was going to simulate agile transformation on paper. Uh, so let's see how much time we got. 
Uh, we have a few minutes, so let me play this uh, along. So this is, uh, these are two types of agile transformation simulations that you potentially uh, may see. And uh, one is a good one, one is not so, such a good one. Um, so think of a typical organizational structure, right? You have a top of IT, top of the house, you have uh, top of IT, I'm using very generic terminology not to, not to make you think that this is any team, any, any company specific. You got a uh, top of IT minus one, you got top of IT minus two, minus three, and this is your typical classic organizational design on IT side. You got a pool of hands-on workers, and a bunch of supporting roles. Let's just call them generically supporting roles: PMO, BAs, uh, uh, you know, manual testers, whatever. Okay. And now let's take a look at the organizational structure and business side of the house. Top of IT, business partner. So it's lateral to to your IT head. And then you have minus ones, and you got organizational structures that are composed of quote unquote. Uh, quote unquote, IT facing delegates, usually uh, business BAs that are interfacing with uh, technology BAs, right? So just you get one, I get one. Uh, key stakeholders, the SMEs, end users, sponsors, etc. And of course, you got supporting roles like BAs, SAs, FSAs, PMO. So this is what's called organiz orga organizational organizational complexity by design. Now uh, here is some. Here you see some undesirable, undesirable organizational calls. Uh, we all have to become more agile this year. Comes from the top of the house. Why? Because they just think it's a trendy thing to do. Oh yes, we will go first because I want to be the, the the I want to be the pioneer. Says one, let's call him CTO or whoever you know, someone who is uh, top of IT minus one. I will go second. And I'll wait and see how my peers are doing. So I'm not ready yet. I'm, I'm worried I'm not gonna be able to do it myself just yet. So you have this, um, you know, these vocal people volunteering, right? And uh, someone's gonna say, well, it's not possible for us at all. We're too legacy. Fine. Okay. Then the commanding, this commanding tone from, from one of these guys, you gotta go first. Forget about your organizational design. You must go first. And uh, well, these guys say, well, we're gonna prepare our people, right? So these are top-down decisions without true organizational assessment. Really, no one really takes, takes enough care to understand what's happening underneath. Um, and someone says, we're gonna do all of the US. Well, why all of the US? Well, you have a half of your people working across the, the globe. Why, why, why just US? You're just splitting your organization in half. One organization is gonna be agile, another half will remain legacy. That doesn't make sense. Right. So, and then you have uh, obviously these folks uh, pool of hands-on workers, and um, you know, you know, obviously the decision is these people are going to have to go first. And since it's usually the hands-on workers that are really doing work, the pool of supporting roles always volunteer first. We want to do it first. We want to go. We want us, us, us. So this is actually where you see a lot of this function in the form of. Well, uh, let me become a Jira master. Let me become a RHEL version one um, system administrator for these scrum teams. So you immediately see these new unnecessary roles being erected within the organizations to make people busy. And in Scrum, in large Scrum specifically, we refer to it as local optimization. Globally, you're going to see still a lot of this function, but these individuals will be very well optimized for what they do. This person will be reconfiguring Jira fields and workflows, making it so, so robust and agile. Um, who cares that, you know, in order for, for a work item to be pushed through this complex flow now, the team needs to click 15 buttons. So here's an example of what, who, who, you know, what, these, what these decisions are based on. And there are some undesirable decisions uh, coming from uh, the business side of the house. Well, this is IT thing only. We might, we just must comply. We we will be supporting supporting them. We're gonna have to be in a spotlight here. And someone here says, "Fine, we'll go first. But personally, I'm too busy to spend time in this. So immediately, someone who actually has power and can uh, make changes, they 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 bail out, and it gets delegated to some folks elsewhere. Everyone is is very complacent. Okay. Everyone wants to watch others do it because there is no state of urgency. And if you play John Carter, if you read the book, you'll realize in order for something to happen, 
In order for senior leadership to actually want to change something, they have to have a state of urgency, a sense of urgency. Okay. Uh, so some the delegates, someone IT facing delegates, so somebody's going to be called a product owner, but he doesn't have any power to make any decisions. So then what, right? And obviously you're going to have a bunch of supporting roles that will say yes, 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 us too, us too. We want to get involved. So you have a lot of agile theater going on here. So there was a mandate coming from the top. You must become, you must do agile as opposed to let's become more adaptive. And that's what you see. And I personally actually struck the word agile out from my dictionary lately. I use the word adaptive and I explain why I use it. Because it's like a more of an English term, more of an English word that's easy to understand. Now there are some better uh, internal calls by IT. You take a pull of hands on workers and give proper uh, messaging from, from the top of the house. CTO minus uh, A and B, make sure you analyze your organizational dependencies, make sure you figure out what your external dependencies are and only then make decisions. And to all my directs, please prepare to visit your org charts. If you're leaving your org, org design as is, your uh, organizational agility is gonna suck. Okay, and in large scale scrum adoption, you absolutely must take a look at your org charts. Otherwise you will be just repurposing existing roles and you will be retaining existing powerhouses and power relationships. And if you, if you don't think it's a problem for basic Scrum, then maybe uh, it won't be a problem for a large scale Scrum. But if you do believe genuinely that uh, powerhouses and old uh, uh, organizational architecture is a challenge for Scrum, then I uh, to say it will be uh, multiplied and amplified in, in less. So um, moving forward on this, um, yes, uh, all in my space, we have identified no independence. So people actually doing homework, right? These are quotes um, indicative of people actually taking the time to think about this, thinking this through and understanding organizational implications of agility at scale, okay? And once you have empowered individuals, then uh, you're in a bunch better shape. So that's the yes, IT side of the house. And you wanna have proper messages coming from uh, business side of the house as well. It's, a, it's, a, it's gotta be a thought world strategic decision. It takes two to tango. It's not, it's not just IT, it's not just business, it's both. And we obviously not, I don't wanna leave out, I'm living out of this picture, but I'm, I am saying this um, you know, out loud, HR, finance, budgeting, people, people that are responsible for um, uh, uh, location strategies, um, all, 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 all those organizational pockets uh, have to be involved, okay? And uh, of course there are, you know, some, proper commands coming from the top of the house and um, people feel empowered now and these people are also empowered you know we, they get proper training uh they get proper coaching and then um, there will be much better everyone understands what their role is and that and this is a much more thoughtful transformation now so instead of trying to blow up the entire house and make them look like they're agile you're making it very, very much more methodically, uh, very thoughtfully. So here's a much better um, internal design on IT side now. So instead of trying to agilize, for the lack of a better term, term the entire organizational tower by, of top of IT minus one A, I'm using arbitrary um, nomenclature here, but you call them a CTO, if you will, as opposed to CTO B, as opposed to CTO C, you actually are looking for those organizational contracts that are interact with one another. So easily you can come across multiple organizational towers to build out your less structure. So if your organizational uh, domain ownership uh, is preventive of creating, uh, you know, a supportive structure for one widely defined product, then your less is not going to work. This should not be a problem. So if there are three teams identified in, in the CTO Tower 1 and three teams here and none here, then don't even bother with these guys. Take two here and now you have your eight, eight team formation that will be supportive of your large scale scrum adoption. It goes across the boundaries of organizational silos as you know them today. And that's how it should be. Because most likely these CTOs, these, these towers are responsible for components and applications. They're not really responsible for cross-cutting products 
features front and back. And for that, you have to go across the boundaries. Uh, and obviously, there could be a better internal call um, on um, about org design on, on, on business side of the house, right? And, um, you know, just everyone else and IT facing delegates, aka um, product owners and supporting staff, SME stakeholders, people that are actually supportive of product owner function. And overall, your org design will look something like this, right? Much simpler. Now, we're not saying we're getting rid of all those other people, but if you want to build something meaningful, if you want to build, build less construct, think of these feature teams. Or I'm actually not using less terminology here for a purpose, for a reason. Think of, this, think of, the, think of these teams as cross-functional feature, feature teams working on the same product for the same customer, unless they're just called teams. Okay? And that would be a sushi roll. And that would be a sushi roll. And then you have to obviously give it additional sushi roll layers, flavors to be supportive of the effort. HR, finance, budgeting, uh, local strat location strategies, etc. Now I'm going to make a pause and I'm going to swap uh, from this deck to another because the rest of this one is just some uh, organizational user stories, if you will. And you will probably have some fun reading them. I'm going to give them to you. Uh, but for now, I'm going to, while I'm swapping over to another deck, I'm going to make a pause and see if you have any questions. And if you, if um, Sasha, tell me if this is not a bad, not a good idea, because if this is uh, going to go until the rest of the conversation, um, the rest of the meeting, then maybe I do want to spend a little bit more time um, and then open up for QA. Okay, guys. Uh, what, what's your choice? Would you uh, let's uh, go thumb up if you want Jean to continue with the presentation, or thumb down if you want us to uh, go to the Q and A. <laughs> okay. Uh, I make it easy for you guys. If even if we go to Q and A, most likely I will be referring back. I'll be referring to my other deck because I have a feeling there will be questions about uh, some tactical implementation and that's what the other deck is for. Like I said, it's a little more dry. Sounds like we are going ahead with, with the deck, uh, but uh, maybe what you could do if somebody has a question on the, on the way, you could uh, ask, uh, ask this question. So, so I'm moving on? Okay. You want me to keep going? Okay. So, okay, so I'm gonna, um, I have swapped to this deck and this deck, the deck for the most part are authentic last that works graphics that come from, uh, from last that works site itself and from uh, one of the books, actually two of the books written by Vada, by Vori and, 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 and Larman. Uh, so this is all actually the real McCoy. These are they're very authentic. This is just a path, pass through slides. Uh, of our first Amsterdam um, last conference two years back. Hopefully this year will be New York City. Um, I was saying about the, the the slides and the graphics that come from the, the so less does have history. Some of you may not know this, but uh, there's more than a decade of research and about 600 experiments about less. And there are three books that support less. It's the, it's the green book, the last book that we recommend reading first because it, it talks a lot about, um, it, it talks about simple stuff in a way that it's very easy to absorb. The other two books are a little heavier and they concentrate on, um, on, um, on guides more than on frameworks, okay? And this is the point we actually made earlier on today, right? Um, Less isn't uh, multiple teams doing their own scrum. This is not a copy paste scrum. Less is many teams working together, scrumming together on the same product. So it's not a, you know, a bunch of horses running each for, for, for themselves. It's a bunch of horses uh, carrying the same horse carriage together. So that's a fundamental difference, right? And when we say less um, requires organizational descaling in order to succeed, we're not suggesting this kind of descaling, right? just breaking down the, the, the house and, and leaving debris. We are discussing, we're, we're, we're mentioning a very methodical, 
very uh, uh, pragmatic um, re reduction of waste, removing organizational silos, removing roles, not jobs. There's a difference between a job security and role security. We stress it a lot in less. In less. Um, so anything that's considered to be as organizational mura, mura is, is mud, waste, you know, mura, muri, mura, right? I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, with those three terms. So we are removing the mura and waste very gradually and very methodically. Uh, and the concept, the, the concept I want, was trying to uh, bring across uh, earlier on is that we want deep and uh, deep and narrow uh, adoptions. We don't want big bangs. We want to grow organically. Um, I'm not even mentioning uh, the uh, what's called less huge when you have more than eight teams working on on a huge product that has multiple areas. Why? Just because it's so easy to understand. Once you understand basic less, basic less. Well, there's no term basic less. Once you understand less, it's easy to understand less huge. So imagine this is less. And as you grow your product, your less formation is going to grow, then you're going to grow into less huge. But you want to start small. We want to start always start small and hopefully success will spread virally. Um, important, on point, unless we only invite people to join by volunteering. Forced, uh, forced participation in less is strongly discouraged. If you see senior management forcing uh, less adoption, but uh, teams um, are not willing to reform and and, and recreate themselves, uh, most likely it's going to be um, you know not, not it will not be a happy ride. You probably have seen this uh, graphic um, if you have visited uh, less uh, that work site. Of course, this is like a you know a homepage, right? It's it's a very very informative graphic too. Uh, it speaks about uh, roles, events, and um, a little bit about artifacts too. So you, you have roles as a product owner. Uh, so we have a Scrum Master. He has a Scrum Master, as you notice. It's in between two teams. These three tracks are three different teams. Why is it there? And just to illustrate that a Scrum Master can be shared by multiple teams, up to three teams. And that is, this is why it is a full-time role because easily your scrum master could uh, be preoccupied because we recommend no more than three teams because then uh, an individual exceeds his human or her human capacity. So if you have up to eight teams in, in less, you roughly have two and a half scrum masters or maybe three scrum masters, two teams, two teams, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, three teams, three teams, and uh, um, and, and two teams, or whichever, way, whichever combination. You may have more than... Uh, uh, three scrum masters. You may have uh, four scrum masters in the last two, 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 and two. But you, you certainly don't want to have more than three teams. By experiments, it is not advisable because then it becomes too, uh, too difficult for one person to handle. Now you have some events that are shared and some events that are team specific. Okay. Again, uh, if any of this requires interpretation, we probably could do it, but uh, uh, that would probably require another few hours of discussion on its own because everything that you see and seems to be easy and less, yes, it is very easy just because Scrum is easy, but what becomes much more difficult to um, appreciate is underlining um, organizational dynamics, system dynamics. What does it really mean to have a few teams coming together and, and working uh, together during a, uh, you know, sprint planning or sprint delegates that are designated uh, to do this? How does it really reflect on, on team dynamics? So those things actually take much longer to discuss. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you a, a quick overview. So the, here's another important, uh, I would say a sticky point, right? You have two major channel, main channels of communication, uh, information flow be between a product owner and um, other people. Um, I, I'm sorry, uh, other, team, uh, other teams. Uh, so a product, everything that's a thick line, thick dotted line, those are primary channels of communication. A product owner communicates with teams, uh, with customers, and with high management. And the dotted lines are secondary uh, communication channels. Now notice something. Uh, you, I often hear this question, well, how come one product owner, how come one product owner can support up to eight scrum teams, uh, up to eight um, less teams in, in less? Well, that depends how you treat his role. If his role uh, is to provide 
all of the clarifications in the world and be responsible for every single answer, he's not going to be able to, she's not going to be able to do the job. So responsibility of a product owner is to set priorities, prioritization, not clarification. Okay. Uh, we, uh, sh we, we encourage in less for clarification to flow as much as possible uh, through customers and users. Okay. Prioritization will come from one person, but clarification comes from, from customers and users. This is the only way to enable one individual, a product owner, to, to support more, multiple teams. Okay. I'm going to skip over this slide just because it's about less huge. Think of less and multiply it by N, where N is number of product areas. Each product area has only one unique additional role. Everything's very simple, very lean. It's called a area product owner. Each last stack is autonomous and independent. Each product area, let's say billing versus invoices versus, um, 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 I don't know, portfolio management versus CRM. Those are product areas. And those are, uh, those are less, Th those are less areas or, or product areas or less areas and each less um, is each less construct it, when it, when you add them all together it becomes less huge so the only extra role there is an area product owner that represents this area and with uh, the what's called overall product owner or just product owner they form um, the form of product owner coalition or product owner team although we don't uh, necessarily formalize it unless not we're very conscious unless not to introduce additional terminology that could be hijacked or very uh, key it's very key we're trying to introduce as little as possible on top of basic scrum uh, another interesting illustration here to show you uh, what it means um, again and it's actually in less huge so i'm going to probably skip over this quickly each each product area has a product area product on us that supports uh, the area and a bunch of feature teams that support this area as well. And each product backlog, uh, I'm sorry, this overall product backlog has different areas, er, um, different views. We don't create a, a separate product backlogs because from a standpoint of a, a key product owner, uh, I'm sorry, overall product owner, it's just one, it's just one product. We don't have additional products, uh, pro uh, product backlogs defined. Okay, uh, and if you look at this from a standpoint of a, uh, you know, if you, if you if you take this into different areas, you will uh, see something like this. Imagine Excel spreadsheet, you're collapsing it on different uh, requirement areas, product areas or requirement areas, and you end up with these backlog views. Each one of these backlogs, a backlog views represents uh, a body of work that would be done by one less contract. Okay, each last team, each last construct up to eight teams will be working on one of these areas. So enough about less huge because it becomes just a, a discussion of, of, of something that repeats itself. <laughs> um, what am I doing? How am I doing on time? 10 minutes to 10 to 10. Um, a, few, a few slides that would be very... Um, easy to read but of course each slide alone you know we can spend much longer time to discuss it here's an example of spring planning as it's um done in less in less um spring planning one you don't have entire teams attending just because if you have up to eight teams imagine um how many people you would have in in, in the event it would be almost 50 people so that's that's not good so each team um sends a representative and this is not just a scrum master. This is someone who really intimately understands day-to-day -day work of a team. So it's, it's a team member. Or maybe, well, maybe a few, depending on how many people you end up with. You don't want this to become um, a, you know, a town hall. You want to keep this meeting shortish as well. It's not long. It's when a product owner sets the tone and, and, dec and decides what he or she wants to do in a sprint. Uh, sprint planning two, where each team goes off in, 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 into their respective quarters and do uh, nitty gritty, uh, you know, work breakdown. Now you notice something here. You may have a, you know, the, the blue box here that shows that a team works on its own, 
and does all the breakdown of work on its own and ends up with its own sprint backlog. These two teams actually do work together. Why? Because they, they suspect there will be some cross-team dependencies in the sprint. And although they end up with the same, uh, they, they end up with their uh, individual respective backlogs, sprint backlogs, they work uh, during sprint planning is shared. They do it together. Okay. Um, in a very similar fashion, again, this is just a drive-through. Um, during PBR session, something similar is happening, right? You don't have everyone in their mother come into a PBR session, you know, to a product backlog refinement session. You may, each team may send its uh, own representatives. Obviously, uh, uh, there's a product owner present as well. And this event is also shortish. It's not very long. So each team rep or reps speak on their respective team's behalf in terms of what the thing the team can do in terms of capacity, in terms of uh, past sprint, uh, sprint velocity. And they uh, just effectively, effectively volunteer for work. And they work out of the same backlog. All these teams work out of the same backlog. They are fungible teams. Uh, think of special forces, like you have five or six uh, units, uh, you know, five or six uh, ranger teams. Each, each, each team can autonomously execute um, on, a mission, on a mission. But when you have five or six or seven or eight teams, obviously you can complete much more. That's the same exact concept here in less. And again, you see here then in a yellow box, you may have uh, product backlog refinement that is team specific, a little more granular that is done by either one team alone, individual blue team, or a few teams come together and do it together because um, they have some dependencies. It all comes down. It, the, the outcome of this is uh, just more refined product backlog. Uh, last but not least, you got uh, end of sprint events, right? Sprint review, everyone and their mother comes. This is where everyone comes, not team reps, but whole teams, because everyone needs to hear from customers and stakeholders and a product owner. And if there is any scrutiny to get, they want to share it. And if there is any glory to receive, they want to share it as well. Uh, retrospectives are done uh, in a somewhat unique way. Each team does their own, do their own dirty laundry, just like you do in Scrum. And then you can send off Scrum Masters uh, to have what's called an overall retrospective to reflect and to handle some system uh, design or organizational impediments that are really not individual teams, not single team specific. This is where you can open up doors and bring in the product owner and management. Hopefully not just line management that are not empowered, but you know, your conventional first line management now. You actually want to invite people that are empowered to make changes. That's, that's, effectively, that's effectively the goal of it. And just like in basic Scrum, uh, every retrospective should have some action items that you execute upon in the next sprint or sprints. Uh, what else is here? So another thing, okay, so a few share, and, and a few highlights of less, which um, obviously require much deeper conversations. We'll refer to this as list, uh, Spring Review Bazaar, right? Everyone and their mother comes. Every team uh, shows what they have done in the, in the sprint. Um, ultimately, a product owner decides what, uh, what it really means in terms of a PSPI. The PSPI is not just per team. PS, oh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Every team contributes to PSPI, but less deliverable is as per um, up to how many teams, up, up to eight teams. So PSPI is shared by the whole less formation, okay? But each team shows what they've done in a previous sprint. Um, each team must have their own definition of done that is a subset of what's called a shared definition of done, which is a lowest common denominator, denominator that is shared by all teams. What does it really mean is that, well, if one team has 75% of test code coverage, and another team has 95% of test code coverage, well, great. So the 75 should become 95, hopefully 100. But the lowest common denominator could be, you know, 65 or 50 as of this moment across all teams. So you want to, you always can improve your DOD, just like you can improve your definition already. You know, it's something that can mature over time. Uh, but each team should have, they should take uh, shared, um, 
the definition of done and, and try to improve it on their own if they can. But as long as they're meeting some um, everyone else's. So that's that's the concept. Uh, in the previous slide, I mentioned there are a couple of different ways of product development. We do speak about it at large in, in less when we actually teach less comprehensively. I'm just going to share it in passing. When does it matter and why does it matter? Um, it specifically matters when you are when we discuss system that when we when we do system modeling and relationships between our product owner and teams. And the three classically classic three known types of product development are um, when you call classic one product development when you have um, external customers, um, external buyers, but your product owner sits in house, and so are the stakeholders and so are the teams. So typically, this is also in, in old language, in conventional terms, it's called a product manager. Someone who has, uh, you know, strategic understanding and strategic uh, ambitions and deals with external customers. Facing teams, he or she is a product owner. There's another one we have in-house internal product development when your customers are also internal people. And if you are a financial firm or if you're... Uh, if you're not a product company like you know like Microsoft or um, you know or I don't know, Dell, then most likely you you see in the yellow stuff you see in this. So if you have in-house development, typically that's what you deal with. And the third type of development is when you're using external development uh, uh, companies or call them uh, de delivery centers that do work for you as a customer and your product. Um, owner sits in-house and so are the users. So this is probably the most challenging formation in my experience because now true relationships between uh, a product owner and, and customers, and I'm sorry, and, and developers are very contractual. It's called, uh, so let me add something to this. Th these are truly uh, these are justifiable legal contracts, right? Because there's mo most likely the SLAs are involved. Um, you know, statement of work is involved. And that's fine. It's just the type of relationship that these uh, contracts govern is not a right one because you don't want to have a contractual relationship between a product owner and, and, and your de delivery teams. So that's that's probably the least advantageous for less, uh, for less and for Scrum. Uh, it's more of a summary page uh, in less for one more of responsible teams, less single function roles, more customer focus, less documentation and contracts, um, teams that understand requirements rather than dedicated analysts, we want ownership, inspection and adaptation as opposed to best practices, owning versus renting. That's from the previous slide, if you recall. Uh, this is kind of busy uh, slide. But if, if you recall, we talked about components, componentized development. This is uh, what we stress, um, you know, I can't stress enough how much we stress it unless, you know, you can't build large scale scrum based on component teams. You have a backlog that's prioritized. You have each team that works on a single component, a lot of handovers, a lot of integration, mini waterfalls, right, uh, left, right, and center. I bet that Team uh, A and Team B right now are working on the first item, which is high priority from a standpoint of a product owner. Guess what item four is? Much lower. So if company, if, if uh, you know, co component Team C can only work on uh, item four because that's their component C, guess what? They're very locally optimized. They'll be doing a great job, a great job, um, delivering something at the end of the sprint will be probably, you know, a lot of heavy lifting, but it will not be deployable, will not be shippable. They would have to integrate it. And therefore, this is not the best uh, way to, um, uh, this is not the best way to, um, to start. Uh, to, it's actually a, a very bad way to, 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 to do your less adoption. Whereas feature teams, um, it's, a, it's, it's a much better way to approach um, iterative development. Each team can touch multiple components. Each team can pick up any of the work items from the backlog in order of priority. Uh, teams are fungible. Teams um, effectively can work in unison. They're not competing with one another, but they're complementing one another. Velocity shouldn't be 
comparable. Uh, they're not, you shouldn't be comparing one team to another. However, just because, and we don't stress velocity um, in, in less, just like we don't stress it in, 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 uh, in basic scrum. But if you do care to um, think about it, then imagine up to eight teams uh, doing working from the same backlog for the same product owner on the same product and having repeatedly um, team representatives coming together and discussing products, uh, product work item, pro product work items. Chances are their understanding of product complexity uh, would be much higher. So if you ever were in a position to say, well, these teams have different velocities, but uh, can we win? Yeah, are, are they um, fungible or can, can we forecast uh, based on output of all eight teams? Then chances are, with less, you will have a much higher chance of hitting the mark than with having seven or eight uh, copy paste scrum teams that have nothing to do with one another but being artificially rolled up into a fake portfolio. Okay, and we talk about fake portfolios a lot in, in, in less as well, but we can, you know, we don't, I don't think we'll cover it today. We talked about this. This is like one of the, you know, huge, of huge importance in less. So this is a pass through. Uh, managing in less, we speak a lot about that. It's just, I don't think we have enough budget down to, to, to do this. Um, we talked about organizational structure being the first order factor. And um, Laura Mann's laws of organizational behavior, I'm not sure how many of you have seen them or read them. Uh, all of us, all of us, and then this is actually one of my uh, quotes lately. I'm often being accused of being number three, right? And you probably guys too. I don't know if you ever were called, you're a revolutionary, you're, you know, you're views are too religious, uh, you know, you're not pragmatic enough, you're a purist, you're a theoretical guy, you don't understand how, uh, how it works in real life. Well, I think we all do. It's just people that are accused of, accusers of that, they represent number four, okay? I'm sorry, too fast. They represent number four, right? And that's what we see a lot of companies. And, you know, if you've, if you've been around, I'm sure you've seen, those quasi uh, coaches and trainers that effectively just, you know, relabeling and, and, and you know, renaming things in the old fashion from, from old to new. Um, the rest is just passed through and this is really it. I mean, that's my own uh, creation. It's called Hexagon of Last Values. And you can, you know, read it on your own. There was a, I had a little write up and this I'll share with you separately. I'm going to sum it up now. I'm five minutes over, and um, if you have any questions, if, you, if I didn't make you tired, please ask. Okay, it was a great presentation. Thank you. So. Oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Please, thank you. Uh, any questions, folks? Uh, Sasha, maybe. Okay, yeah. let me go first. It looks like everybody's shy. So uh, we are talking about a scrum master working with uh, two, three teams. And that's pretty clear. Now we are going to uh, we have a few project level events. We also probably have to deal with project level impediments. Do we want to have uh, somebody like an Uber scrum master who will be acting on the project level? Uh, so no, we, so this is, um, this isn't, uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, a scrum master of scrum masters kind of thing. Is that what you're referring to? Like, uh, so really, so we don't, in, in large scale scrum, we don't want to uh, complicate things by enforcing um, additional role, enforcing additional roles and additional events. Uh, the reason why we have up to three teams uh, for one scrum message is because based on experiments that has worked in the past best, more, um, you know, more teams uh, for one person would become an overhead. Uh, there's a lot of coordination in less that takes place uh, on demand, optional. Nothing prevents 
teams from uh, connecting outside of classic Scrum events, just like in basic Scrum and do what's needed. Uh, enforced coordination or what's called fractal Scrum, when you have uh, each, each team has um, a dedicated Scrum master and each team has a dedicated um, uh, you know, and then a project manager, and then you have just this myriad, of, a pyramid of, you, you just going back to the, what you came from. So this additional um, coordination that is by force, by, by, by mandate, um, oftentimes translates into uh, uh, status calls and, 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 and status quoting and metrics collection and becomes an overhead and also leads to local optimization because now if you have these mandatory events and you have to have people going there, then people will be optimizing themselves to go there and to make themselves uh, busy. You know, in, unless it is not a problem to keep a scrum master busy, soup to nuts because up to three teams, even two teams in, of less formation require a lot of attention. So a team, uh, a scrum master will be hands full. So coordination, and coordination really isn't done through Scrum Masters. I mean, we don't want to view Scrum Masters as as, as um, coordinators, uh, um, administrators, uh, enforcers, uh, unless there's a basic Scrum principles. We don't want them to, to be like bay watchers. So, and we try to delegate as much as possible to teams themselves. And often we play in, not only in less, in basic Scrum, I do, do this quite a bit, quite often. I play the, the, the game, it's called Who Stole My Cheese? I think I have a slide for this somewhere, maybe not. It's called Who Stole My Cheese? Who Stole My Cheese is the game where you have a bunch of uh, teams, a bunch of people in the room that are coming to training and we say, okay, well, let's identify all events, all of the uh, activities that you see on a conventional project and let's map it to uh, what we know as scrum roles. A team is one role, a scrum master is another role, and a product owner. And I have seen uh, so many times when there is center mass, majority of uh, activities are with the team, are much fewer than you would think with a product owner and very few with a scrum master. And there are some other too, like budgeting. Um, I'm sorry, not budget. Budgeting, actual budgeting is the product owner's responsibility, but uh, procurement, uh, buying software, buy, buying hardware, doing some admin work falls on the project manager's lap. So the point I guess I'm trying to make is that a lot of coordination and orchestration is back onto teams. Uh, we give them autonomy and it takes time for them to mature. I don't have a slide here, but there are different levels of maturity for a team. Some teams just can execute tasks that are given to them. Some more mature teams can actually uh, set their own schedule and work and, and, and push work through flow autonomously without managerial involvement. Some teams can, actually uh, self-form, and that's what we want unless people want to volunteer and they self-form. And there's even high state of maturity when the teams can self-govern. It's like further down the line. But we certainly don't want to have, uh, so I guess it's a long answer to your shorter question, Sasha. We don't want unless to see uh, mandatory roles, um, multiple Scrum Masters doing mandatory events uh, in, in, in volume. Okay, there could be some other other way, other ways, uh, other options where this is this has proven to be effective, but not unless. Okay, thank you. Fair enough. Sure. Hey, Gene, um, yeah. where ha has anyone used less in a non-software development environment? Um, I could probably, you know, if I'm allowed to fire up my, so let me shut down this thing. Uh, there are plenty of um, case studies. So let me go to less.works. So if you go to less.works, it has been, you know, very thorough document. Of course, I'm more familiar with, uh, and I really don't want to, on the open line, dis dis disclose, disclaim clients and, and apl application of less, um, on my watch, but if you go on the resources, if you go to under, um, I'm sorry, on the case studies down here, you have uh, a bunch of uh, examples where a less has been applied. For instance, in BMW, I don't believe it's only for software engineering. There are a bunch of other places. John Deere, I don't believe it's just engineering. Uh, you can explore. 
you can take a look. It's, I think in, in the opening statement of every case study, it, it kind of explains where less has been ex uh, applied. One, one thing needs to be clear, actually, it's, it's a disclaimer, if you will. Less is relatively, relatively new in, um, in, the, in the United States, just because m most of uh, less adopt adoptions and adopt uh, adapters uh, were in EMEA and in Eastern Europe. This is where there's a lot of activity, a lot of center mass. It's just coming to the US now. I mean, we're talking about there was a shift, gradual shift. There's a gradual propagation, but it will take uh, a little bit of time. And there will be many more case studies here. Just the forecast on my end. Yeah, I wanted to add about this that less as a, an implication to sales department of organization, a combination of uh, digital marketing, creative teams when they have. Um, designers and uh, researchers and front-end developers and customer service support. It's very common in uh, in many countries. And I think IDEO in the US, they're using less, but I would argue then, for example, I sent one of my paper for review and um, some guy who is uh, like doing less in idio and he was saying that combination of design thinking lean agile and devops if you don't if you're doing this it's less but i would argue that it's not less because less more touching higher level of organization it's higher carrying up to the organizational agility where combining design thinking lean Agile and DevOps, it would be lower level. But this is my just I, I kind of feedback I received. Uh, they saying it's still less. Well, less is um, you know if if of any interest, less does um, piggyback a lot off of uh, lean thinking and system thinking. So if um, you know how does it? I mean. And I'm really not promoting that side because it's pretty um, wide open. But if uh, people would like to see, if you go to on the principles, uh, it talks about lean thinking, system thinking, empirical process control. Um, everything is um, obviously it's based on, um, on on many years of exp experiments. So it, I guess it's fair to say that. Less is very easy to understand when you look at the graphic that represents this picture and some of the events. It's the underlining system dynamics that is pretty pretty mind blowing if you start understanding them, right? And we, what we do in, in uh, when we do in, in, in less training, comprehensive training, we use a lot of what's called system modeling. Uh, using we use causal loop diagrams. I don't know if I have a quick slide to show you. Maybe I'll do this uh, since I'm sharing my screen already. I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you anyway. Um, and uh, and this just uh, reveals so much stuff uh, that, you know, it, sometimes it's painful to consume, right? Let me, you, you think you're looking at the peripheral, um, uh, peripheral manifestation of a problem and you think, oh, that's maybe that's a problem. In order to fix it, we need just to fix what's causing it. But in reality, what you need to look at, uh, we need to look at uh, system dynamics that sit, um, you know, two or three levels, four levels up, up the stream. So um, it's called system modeling. You're trying to reveal um, cause and effect relationships, causations, because a lot of correlations in the system. Like, you know, there is rain uh, and the stock market is open. That's correlation. They just start, happen to happen happen to take place on the, um, on the same day. But if there is constant, continuous rain and your soil is wet, and because of soil is wet, your flowers are flourishing, that's, that's causation. Um, here's an example of, this is what we typically spend time on doing in less, right? This is very boring, right? This is like errors and, and these are system variables. In order to understand why this is happening, 
we may have to drill it back and back and back when we can find a bunch of other indicators, system variables that, uh, that affect it. So that's what we affect the world. That's what we spend most of the time doing practically in, in, less, in less training because we don't really question for a second that people understand, I mean, understanding basic scrum is a prerequisite. Roles, responsibilities, artifacts, that's all I've given. Uh, what we want people, uh, what we want less practitioners to understand is system design implications of less adoptions, really. It's either to say a teams are working for the same product owner and uh, uh, they're just working on the same product. But now your organization is much more complex than this. You have processes, tools, norms, policies, uh, roadblocks, uh, gate, gate, uh, various gates, and all of that has to be addressed. All right. Um, anything else, folks? Any? Um, uh, you're going to, uh, to go to the job dead. <laughs> I, I, I have one more question. I'm um, dropping dead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I I I often question the veracity of something unless someone talks about where it doesn't work. So mm -hmm. where does this not work? Um. And I'm not talking about dysfunctional organizations necessarily. Mm -hmm. I, I'm saying, where does less not operate well within a reasonably healthy organization? Mm. Well, first, first of all, um, how about this? Um, like any scaler, any person who understands uh, Scrum scaling, I can tell you to the extent possible, the advice is not to scale. In other words, if you can't get away without scaling up and you know less is complexity right of, of scrum if you can get away without doing it please please do that please please avoid scaling and therefore you may have a very healthy organization uh that has very simple very basic products or maybe may not even have products per se may have uh chunks of a very independent products that have nothing to do with one another and you can perfectly function in which case don't scale, keep it, keep it simple, keep it separate. So your organization could be still pretty functional, pretty uh, profitable, but you don't necessarily apply less there. Uh, another, another place, another time when I potentially may see when less isn't, uh, you know, may not be applicable. Well, if you don't have a clearly defined uh, product ownership or customer base, or, or if your work is so, you know, so non-product centric, you like customer support or level one support, then, you know, maybe you will decide, okay, why don't we just use Kanban instead? Or why don't we just do whatever, something ad hoc? So forming something into less just for the sake of calling it scaling, and that's, that's, that, that would be not a good idea. That's in my, in my view, that, that this is where it wouldn't work. Or if you have a, a so when, when, when your system optimizing goal, listen, that's actually a very good one. Uh, we talk about feature centric development in less, right? We have to develop features. We don't develop components because we are optimized for delivering um, potential shippable product increment that has business value to an end customer. And therefore each team and therefore the entire less contract must deliver potential shippable product increment operate in a feature centric fashion. Now think about defense, defense industry. If your system is optimized not to deliver um, iteratively and uh, uh, cross cutting components, if your system is optimized for secrecy, then maybe less isn't a good approach. Why? Because there is actually, there's a system optimizing goal for every team, for every department, for every individual, just to know one specific niche of the overall, you know, design or, or, or code base. Why? Because otherwise, um, it, the you know, company would run high risk of someone being abducted by uh, by another country, right? So if you build a building, build, building a NORAD system or a surface to air missile or into ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile, 
you don't want one engineer to know everything from from the uh, you know from the uh, from a gas tank uh, to the warhead. Then you just have all the knowledge in one mind, and that's it. So in this case, less may not be an option. It may not be the best approach. That's that's really insightful. Thank you for that. That's my thanks, Dan. Well, anyone else? Going once, going I have, twice. I have one. I have one. <laughs> Hopefully, a quick one. Um, what what is the success of say having amongst all the Scrum teams in the less um, having maybe a Scrum bond team or having a Kanban team in place of a um, Scrum team? So in less construct, the question is, would it be better to, instead of having a scrum team, having a Kanban team? Is that if the, the team, If the team itself is better suited to be a scrum ban or a Kanban team, uh, would the less still succeed just as well? So um, I just want to make sure I understand the question right. So I think Kanban has its own place to exist and actually it's a very good, effective, way to do certain things and scrum bond, i understand the term and i understand the dynamic of a team that does scrum bond as well but i'm not sure if i understand the question that is is, is the question about mixing and matching the two or substituting so, one so let me let me paraphrase so so every team has to be strictly a scrum uh scrum team in less you know in less in order for less to succeed well, less is Scrum, so uh, by virtue of being Scrum, it's just, you know, going back to the slide, so maybe uh, this is a slide, right? So less is, where's that slide? It says- Can I plug in an XP team into, into a company that is practicing less or a unit, business unit that is practicing? Well, think about it this way. Uh, so XP, uh, familiar with XP, not, that intimate with XP, but I can tell you, imagine you have eight wheels, right? And one of them is doing something different from the other seven. So I just don't know, you know, we, you, we can discuss and we can probably do a, a whiteboard, whiteboarding on, on how you can take you know, five or seven XP teams and roll them up into uh, less formation. As far as I know, in XP, you don't have a notion of a product owner. In I XP, you have an on-site customer, right? So it's you have an on-site customer, yeah. So I, I, I don't. I mean, the problem with this question, I think, is really, is XP Scrum and is Scrum Bon Scrum? And there's some arguments to be made, and I think even Jeff Sutherland makes them that Type Three Scrum is effectively Scrum Bon. So yeah. It, it seems like it would scale totally, Gene, totally, with Scrum Bond as the underlying philosophy. I, Could I don't be. see how it changes. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. Um, you know, if I were to, you know, you can, you know, I have written and I have, I have read and written equal, um, equally on uh, Kanban at scale or con enterprise Kanban. So when we say scale, we mean be you know, something big, something wider. So as long as we're not creating system distortion where you have gears spinning at a different speed and, and you know, hitting each other, you know, I think it, it could work. It may have its own place. I would rather, instead of comparing uh, XP to less or thinking of less, can XP fit into less, I would just take a look at XP versus Scrum and say, okay, well, if we can substitute Scrum by XP and still uh, satisfy our customers. And let's think if we can scale up XP maybe to satisfy our customer even better. Maybe something like, along those lines. Thank you. All Thanks right, guys. Thank you for, for asking the question, Matt. Um, hey, are you gonna supply the slides? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's not, those are, that, that's a given. I'll, I'll, I'll zap them and I'll ship them maybe to, um, to um to Sasha or to all you guys. Uh, I, think, I don't just, know really how could uh, I could distribute that because uh, usually I put 
uh, a link to the video to the uh, BLN website. Yep. Uh, but uh, if uh, but if I have the slides and you guys participants would like to have them, I could just forward them. I will, I will submit them. I'll send them to you, Sasha, in a day or two, Lim, because it's pretty late down here. So I need to unplug uh, as soon as I unplug. <laughs> but I'll get it to you in, 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 in a bit. Yeah, thank you for staying that late. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, really appreciate it. I'll, uh, I place the recording to the BLN website and I will send the mail that it's in there. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link at LinkedIn. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, yep. Okay. Bye. Good nice evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good night, folks. Cheers. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night.